Okay. Thank you, Lord Stern, for speaking to EY Times. Now, as we heard in your talk um, previously and historically, uh, economic activity has been associated with rising emissions. So doesn't this suggest that we need to move to a degrowth agenda? It means that we move to an agenda that reduces emissions, and that's not the same thing. Essentially, we have to break the relationship between consumption and production on the one hand, and the emissions and the uh, damage to the environment on the other. And we can see how to do that. Um, of course, using less energy, becoming more energy efficient is a, one big part of the story. But also using our energy and creating our energy in different ways. Um, renewables uh, will be particularly important in that story, solar, wind, tidal, and so on. But so too will be the link between our use and um, the activity of generation. I mean, things like smart grids and controlling things much better, which is part of the uh, energy efficiency story, but it's a bit, um, a bit more than that. So being much smarter about what we do and being much less polluting about what we do, um, thinking about the consequences of our actions, for example, when we uh, destroy the the forests, the uh, consequences are not simply, although it's extremely important in terms of emissions, but also in terms of biodiversity. Uh, when we burn uh, coal or hydrocarbons in our transport, the consequences are not simply the emissions of greenhouse gases, they're also air pollution, which uh, kills millions a year. So it's thinking in different ways, but we can see how to go. Um, use less energy, produce it in different ways, uh, use it uh, in much smarter ways, and think about consequences beyond just climate change, because there are other things happening too. Okay, now you've called uh, climate change the greatest market failure so far. So should we not then look beyond market-based instruments for dealing with this climate crisis? We're going to have to uh, work with markets, because on the whole, those are the incentive structures facing people. So if something is very damaging, we should not think that it's right to give it away for free. Um, if people use land and resources, we would expect them to recognise the value of the land and the resources in the prices that they face. Um, if we uh, do things which are very damaging, uh, pollute and throw out uh, rubbish in various ways, then um, we shouldn't do that for nothing. To, to do it for nothing is, is a subsidy. To, to let people do something that's very costly for zero price is a subsidy. So we need to work with the markets because so those are the incentives that govern most decisions. But at the same time, I think we're going to have to use a lot of regulation as well. We regulated um, from leaded to unleaded petrol. We regulate smoking to uh, a great extent where people can smoke, which should be affecting their behaviour. We regulate emissions from cars. And we've seen that when we do regulate uh, emissions from cars, subject to a bit of uh, skullduggery here and there, uh, we do uh, have an effect on um, what those emissions might be. So this is a story where you're going to have to use regulatory structures, but also um, we're going to have to use the market. An attempt to do everything without the market usually leads to uh, a great deal of chaos. Now, you mentioned uh, car regulation there. And in the wake of the Volkswagen diesel, dieselgate scandal, does this suggest that businesses can no longer be progressive players when we talk about uh, you know, climate change and how to, to mediate against it? That's a very bad example. Um, and there's no way that you could or should justify it. You have to learn from the experience about how to make those things uh, less likely. Uh, transparency, exposure, and consequences of doing those things, uh, punishment in other words, um, are very important. But at the same time, there are many examples of businesses that are changing. If you look at Unilever, for example, it's put together um, its uh, tropical rain 
forest uh, programs where they are with other big players um, trying to make sure that when they buy palm oil it's from uh, places which have um, acted responsibly. You know, they've, they've worked on brown land or you know, they've, they've avoided the problems of deforestation which you can do. Um, there are many firms um, which are looking very hard at their own emissions. IKEA, for example, is doing exactly that and trying to find products that um, have less emissions embodied in them in their production process, process, processes. Many companies are um, using internal carbon prices and many companies that are acting more responsibly on this uh, dimension are finding actually they're doing pretty well in the process. Obviously, if they're energy efficient, they save resources. But also they're finding that customers uh, see them as responsible and are more ready to buy from them. So there will be bad examples. You know, the Volkswagen uh, defeat devices uh, were uh, surely very bad examples. But there's some good examples too. And finally, as we look ahead to COP21, what kind of agreement do you think would you like to see come out of COP21? Well, we have. I want to answer that question in terms of what we know is going to come out of it, at least one thing we know that's going to come out of it. We know that the sum total of the emissions that are indicated for uh, 2030, which are an important part of this COP21 discussion in Paris, um, are going to be too high for two degrees. We know that already because we can see where they're going. So for me, the test of success in Paris is not that by itself because we can see where that's going. But it's learning from that. It's recognising that there's a big gap between what's been indicated for 2030 and where we'd need to be. And therefore, having recognised the gap, discussing carefully and credibly how we raise our ambitions beyond Paris. So in other words, Paris is the beginnings of a process. It's a lot better than not beginning the process. The promises that have come in are much better, or the indications that have come in are much better than business as, as usual, although not enough, nowhere near enough for two degrees. So the test is ramping up ambition. How are we going to measure progress uh, in a transparent way? How are we going to learn from each other? How are we going to invest in... Uh, new technologies, how are cities going to uh, share ideas on uh, how to go forward? Are uh, rich countries going to come up with um, uh, financial flows that are going to be really helpful to poor countries? Those seem to me to be the tests of credibility of the intention to ramp up ambition. We can see good progress on those dimensions, but for me, success in Paris will... Uh, should be judged by just how strong those are. Okay, thank you, Lord Stone.